Hello everyone, bentrovati, welcome and uh, thank you for being so numerous today. We have registrants joining us from all of the United States, Italy, but also from the rest of Europe and even Asia. For those of you who are connecting with us for the first time, I am Emanuele Amendola and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute at the Embassy of Italy in Washington DC. The occasion for today's program is the international release of the book Bulgari Roma, Beauty Tales for Travel Lovers, a really special guide to Rome its key historical sites and the designs of Bulgari that they inspired. This webinar will consist in a presentation by art historian and curator Costantino Dorazio, who will guide us through the Eternal City and its legacy, how Rome inspired Bulgari, but also how the city has been a muse for artists and architects in the world. The program will continue with live readings of two short stories inspired by Rome, written especially for this book by acclaimed authors Andre Asiman and Melania Mazzucco. We will then have some time for a Q&A session with our speakers, so feel free to type your questions and comments in the Q&A or in the chat section, and we will try to answer to as many of you as possible. Introducing us to this unique and emotional virtual journey to Rome will be our ambassador, Armando Varricchio, and the CEO of Bulgari, Jean-Christophe Babin. So without further ado, I'm now very pleased to give the microphone to Armando Varricchio, ambassador of Italy to the United States. Ambasciatore. Thank you very much, dear friends, cari amici. Uh, I'm so pleased to welcome you here today. Uh, thank you, Director Amendola, for your kind introduction, and a special welcome to Jean-Christophe Babin, CEO of Bulgari. The Eternal City, as it is known worldwide, has indeed been a source of inspiration for people of all time and across the globe. It stands on more than 2,500 years of history. And I say this with respect. Uh, I was born in Venice, a city that this year celebrates 1,500 years. But you know, uh, Rome is much older. So it for us is a reason of pride in Italy. It was one, the largest city in the world and the center for Western civilization. Today, it is a modern cosmopolitan, vibrant city and among the most visited tourist destinations in the world. As many native Romans will tell you, one lifetime is not enough to really know Rome. This is why we are particularly pleased today that someone so deeply knowledgeable of Rome, such as Professor Costantino Dorazio, will guide us through the city, unveiling some of his treasures and stories. I find it particularly meaningful to speak about Rome and the many pieces that make up the beautiful mosaic of the Eternal City for several reasons. Rome is an essential part of Italy's identity. Over the years, it has also contributed meaningfully to the construction of European and Western cultural identity. There's no Europe without Rome. And today, owing to its many visitors and the creativity of innovation it continues to spark, it enables a thriving cross-cultural dialogue. Uh, Rome has, has so much history on its, old, on its shoulders, but at the same time is able to move forward and always be a beacon of innovation. That tangible and intangible asset that is the Roman culture has shaped our past and can be drawn upon today to inspire ideas to tackle the many challenges that lay ahead. And it is quite indeed fitting that several months from now, heads of state and government will be meeting Rome for the G20 summit to trace a sustainable path towards the future. As the old Roman saying used to uh, say, all roads lead to Rome. Facets of Rome legacy can be found in the arts, music, cinema, literature, and design. Today, I look forward to hearing how the Eternal City has inspired two great authors, Melania Mazzucco and André Essiman, and of course, Bulgar, the quintessential brand that has so exquisitely interpreted the culture of beauty and aesthetics, a constant feature of Roman and of the Italian national identity with its extraordinary faces of jewelry. Allow me one further consideration. Rome's historic center has been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and its treasures are 
inestimable. Yet, such superb assets require protection. Beauty is fragile. And Italy is deeply committed to the protection of Italy's cultural heritage. And in this field, we are particularly pleased to work hand in hand with the US authorities, also in the framework of our memorandum of understanding on the protection of cultural heritage. I myself, I have many personal memories and I will never forget as a Venetian native, the first time I actually had a chance to visit Rome. But that enchantment is always renewed every time I fly back from the US to Rome, every time I land in the Eternal City, and even from the, from the airplane, I look at the landscape, this beautiful connection between nature and what humans have been able to create since the early days, since the most innovative creation. So that the past connect with the present and looks into the future. But in close me, allow me to put away my notes and talk from my heart for just a moment. This is something that uh, uh, I feel very much about. Rome is the quintessential uh, name of Italy. Uh, wherever I travel, particularly in this beautiful country where I had the honor to serve uh, uh, my country, uh, I always uh, am surrounded by the deep love and affection for a city which is absolutely unique. So thank you again for everyone who has made this event possible and to everyone who is tuning to be taken on this wonderful stroll, as we say, passeggiata through the streets of Rome to feel closer to Italy and its great cultural heritage. Grazie. Grazie, Ambasciatore. And now I'm happy to leave the screen to Jean-Christophe Baben, CEO of Bulgari. Mr. Baben, it's an honor having you with us. Uh, grazie, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, e Excellency. Uh, uh, I was about to, to speak your words, so you, you stole my thought, so I, I will be crisper. Uh, well, for me, uh, this book is just extraordinary uh, because uh, it's about Rome, but on a totally different angle, which uh, Constanzo has managed really uh, to imagine and envision, and this kind of creativity is typically Italian and Roman. And this book indeed is not uh, a travel book uh, like uh, any existing travel book. It's a very strange and amazing and mesmerizing mix, I would say, uh, of destinations, like uh, obviously a good white book is, but those destinations have all uh, in common uh, to have a way or another impacted on the style of, of Bulgari. And Bulgari, we are discussing with His Excellency 10 minutes ago, would never be uh, the reputable uh, world leader in high jewelry, jewelry uh, rather than in many other categories uh, without the influence of the city of Rome. The, the company was born thanks to the Bulgari family. They were from Greek origins. And this already is emblematic of our city. Uh, the strength of Rome has ever been uh, inclusion. Uh, the Roman had the wisdom uh, when the city was created and right after to incorporate, integrate uh, the Greek, the Egyptian, the Etruscan, the Phoenician cultures. And this has led to an empire which uh, has been the longest reigning empire of all times. But beyond, I mean, the power of the empire, uh, the influence uh, of that empire on uh, our today's lives. I think that uh, like China has shaped most of Asia, uh, Italy and Rome uh, very similarly have shaped the Western world. I was myself born in Paris. Uh, I'm Italian, so I will show you, but I was born in Paris. And when I look back uh, those years in Paris, being uh, today obviously living in Rome, which is the headquarters of Bulgari, uh, I cannot not smile as uh, Napoleon uh, has turned Paris into a Roman city uh, 19th centuries after uh, Augustus uh, himself really laid the foundation of the Roman Empire. And uh, uh, thinking about uh, His Excellency living in Washington, and Washington is built in another city which could have been built by Romans because again, uh, we can see in the architecture of the main landmarks of Washington city, uh, exactly uh, this Roman influence. And if we think about also uh, our laws, 
the civil code uh, of uh, the Western world. Of, at least they are not exactly the same, but I would say that uh, in Europe, typically 80% uh, of our laws are directly coming from, from Rome and from the Roman, and uh, they've been obviously updated, uh, but they're still are. And last but not least, uh, when you think about art, uh, obviously, uh, initially, Roma has integrated uh, the Mediterranean arts coming from uh, the many countries I mentioned before. But gradually, the city has also developed arts, uh, I would say, uh, which have been really totally invented uh, in Rome. I think the most famous is, uh, without any kind of discussion, the Barocco art. Uh, it's something which is born in Rome, which has been really a revolution uh, in terms of, uh, of art. And more recently, I mean, one century ago, and uh, I'm talking to you from one of those buildings uh, in the 30s, uh, in the time of uh, Mussolini, uh, there has been a neoclassical art, uh, which was born in Rome as well, uh, very much inspired somehow from the initial Roman art but which is today also considered in terms of architecture. I think about the Eor district in Rome uh, with one of the landmarks, which is Palazzo della Civiltà, where our sister brand Fendi has headquarters, is also another example on how Rome has ever been at the forefront uh, of arts, of culture, uh, and, uh, and eventually uh, shaping uh, the Western world in a way, no other country or no other city uh, has ever been even uh, close to. Uh, why do I tell that? Because uh, this influence has been the same of Bulgari. And uh, if you look at uh, Bulgari's style in terms of jewelry, it's totally different from any other big brand, which we respect. One is in New York, by the way. It belongs to the same group as Bulgari. Uh, another one is in Paris. And each of those brands uh, mirror basically uh, the environment. Uh, and Bulgari is Bulgari because Rome is made of domes, of contrast, of colors. Uh, Rome is big as well. I mean, everything in Rome is larger than life. Uh, there is a thread across 27 centuries, which has been the magnificence, uh, be it uh, the Pantheon or the Colosseo uh, 2000 years ago, or the Vittoriano uh, one century ago only, uh, everything which has been erected in Rome uh, surpasses any kind of uh, imagination when it comes to the dimension. And eventually a city which could be heterogeneous is very homogeneous despite so many styles and influences because at the end of the day, everything is big. And everything is big, uh, it, it builds consistency out of total diversity. And this is the same for Bulgari. Our jewelry has ever been uh, considered uh, as very strong in terms of pedigree. Uh, we use colors, we are inspired by the domes. We love the contrast, the strengths of our style. And this is very much a mirror. So Roma is Bulgari and Bulgari is Roma. And that book brings a lot of emotions. Usually uh, city books are very functional. And there are so many that it was useless to, to do another one. But here, between uh, the places uh, which Costanzo has decided to select, the tales, and we'll have, I mean, today two extraordinary uh, writers uh, taking us into the tales, and the stories, uh, we have something uh, not only extremely instructive, but something utterly emotional. And reading it many times myself, uh, I recognize my own experience in Rome. I've been living there eight years. Uh, through the lines of most of the contributors, I mean, uh, be it Andre, Melania, Rosanna, Boy George, Andrea Di Sica, Isabella Ferrari, Juan Ru, whoever, uh, I could recognize myself. And uh, to end up that introduction and on a personal note, uh, I'm so much in love with the city that uh, I, I myself, it's not a promotion, but I, I wrote a book, uh, which is called uh, Roma Capuzensi. And Roma Capuzensi, for those knowing Latin, means that Roma dominates your senses. And this is exactly, I mean, what I felt when I uh, arrived in Rome for the first time uh, to live permanently. I'm just in love with Rome. Uh, like all the people who have been uh, participating to that uh, amazing book. And 
it really makes my life very different. I've ever been very happy uh, in all the cities where I've been living. I mean, uh, from Germany to France, Switzerland, or, or the UK, uh, Milan as well. I mean, uh, I've been living many, many years of my life in Italy. But I have to say that Rome for me uh, is a great part of my happiness. And uh, I'm thankful to Destiny to have brought me to that city, to that jewel uh, called Bulgari, as it has really changed my life, that it will change it forever. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Baben, and again, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, your remarks uh, and uh, for uh, setting the mood for this uh, special visit to Rome. We are now ready to embark uh, on our journey, and uh, I would like to call on screen Costantino Dorazio. Costantino Dorazio is uh, an art historian and uh, curator at the uh, Rome Municipality Cultural Heritage Department. Professor Dorazio is a regular guest on uh, numerous shows on art that air on uh, national Italian television, and uh, he is the author of many books on classic artists such as Leonardo, Raffaello and Michelangelo. Costantino, grazie mille per essere con noi. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you uh, to go immediately with the video that we prepared. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to start immediately getting into this stroll, as the ambassador uh, said before. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm, I thank everybody, all the ones that uh, invited me to make to give this lecture. Um, so the uh, the video that you are seeing now it's been made with a with a drone during the uh, pandemic for the very first part of the pandemic. Um, and as you can see, it's it's a kind of way to see the large monuments of Rome, the most famous monuments of Rome through a different point of view. The point of view of birds, the point of view of seagulls, uh, those that were absolutely the only one that could live outdoor in that moment uh, in Rome. Uh, and this is somehow what we uh, attempted to do in creating this book, uh, because it's uh, a way to go through the city of Rome, as I will show you and I will try to do with you uh, today. But it's also a way to look at Rome through a different kind of, uh, a different point of view, a different kind of eyes. It's the eyes of those jewelers that uh, had the, that dared, that had the, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, leaving their country at the end of the 1800s and move to Rome. Uh, first of all, because they were attracted by all of this beauty that you are seeing now in this video. But secondly, because they felt that Rome could absolutely be uh, a source of inspiration for their work. They were coming from Greece. They were uh, familiar with, uh, uh, the, uh, with the classical uh, features, uh, design that uh, the Romans had inherited from their own country. They were also part of that uh, moment in which Rome was the destination for all those that were interested into creativity and history. And uh, those that were joining the Grand Tour, so-called Grand Tour, uh, but they were also quite sensitive. Uh, that's why they absorbed in their design what Rome was offering them. Uh, so uh, the idea today is going to be uh, that I will really, really lead you, escort you through uh, a little part of the historical center of Rome, um, starting from the, the door that was the door for all those that were entering Rome until uh, the late 1800s. Even the Bulgaris, maybe, if uh, uh, they, uh, most probably, they entered Rome from Piazza del Popolo. That, uh, now it's all surrounded by, uh, by buildings, but until the late 1800s, it was looking like this. As you can see, it's a plan of Rome. It, it, this, is, this dates by 1700s, but uh, until the 1870s, this is how it was looking, completely surrounded by countryside, by villas, by uh, fields, and you can see that the river Tiber was really, really touching the city. So Rome was a small town 
surrounded by the countryside. And the very first part of Rome that you would see if you entered Rome was this one here. So it's not the square that you see today, Piazza del Popolo, but Piazza del Popolo was a, a field uh, with this obelisk in the middle. Well, the idea of the obelisk came to a Pope, Pope Sixtus uh, V, uh, and until the 1870s, the popes were the governors of Rome. They were behaving not only like religious leaders, but they were behaving like urban planners. And starting from the 1400s and in the 1500s, like uh, um, Sixtus V, they started collecting, getting pieces that were coming from underground because they started excavating underground Rome and they started moving what they were finding, like the ancient monuments of Rome, in order to give Rome a different look and a different perspective and a different urban plan. So Sixtus V decided to move this obelisk that was uh, in the center of the Circus of Maxentius, it was down far away along the Appian Way, brought to Rome by Emperor Augustus, he decided to move it at the entrance of Rome, to mark the entrance of Rome with this ancient piece. And as you saw in the previous, uh, in the previous slide, Piazza del Popolo was not in the center of Rome. Piazza del Popolo was in the far north of Rome, was the borders of the city, but it became the central square of the new town decided by six to the fifth. Maybe it was the only city in the world that had the, the, the main square in one of the far um, ending you know, and the north. It completely changed the way the city was moving and was organized. So the, the obelisk was there to mark the entrance of a glorious city. And uh, it remained there. This is quite interesting. The choices of most of the popes, even taken 500 years ago, didn't change. The city was built up, grew up surrounding, around these choices, adding design, adding architectures in order to dialogue with, with, with what was there before. So when in the 1800s, Napoleon wanted to turn the city into the capital of his empire, Piazza del Popolo had to welcome the emperor. And that's why they made this design with the two curves, with the two exedras. But Napoleon uh, was defeated in Waterloo before having the possibility to enter Rome as an emperor, but the, 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 the square remained there. Now you may think that Piazza del Popolo comes from the name, the word, the noun people. You may translate it people square, but it's not right. That popolo comes from the Latin populus, which of course was meaning also people, but was also meaning poplar, the tree. So. Uh, where the square is now, there was a, a little woods, a little group of poplars, uh, where the legend said uh, the bad spirit of Emperor Nero was uh, living. So the, the, the presence of these poplars remained in the name of the city. The, even the names in Rome uh, gives ba give back the story, the legacy of the city. The obelisk, is an, an amazing way of using uh, a symbol, a religious symbol, changing its identity in the history. Because it's, it, it was born as, a, as an Egyptian religious symbol. All of these hieroglyphs that you see carved on, on, they are an ode to the Pharaoh. Uh, and the name of the Pharaoh is repeated many times. You can see in this uh, oval, in this oval shape. Then it became a Roman symbol wrote by the emperor and it became quite fashionable. After Augustus, uh, there were another seven, uh, 13 obelisks uh, brought from Egypt to Rome and they're still here. And then it became 
a Christian, uh, um, a religious Christian symbol topped by the cross, as you can see it now. And it was absolutely impossible for the, uh, the Bulgari not to look at that because when they arrived to Rome, the obelisk was still used as the starting point of the horse race that was uh, running all along Via del Corso, the main long straight streets uh, st that was starting from the obelisk. And this, uh, um, uh, this uh, activity, this event, this ceremony that was uh, uh, happening during carnival uh, was still there in the 1800s because he, look at this picture. This photo was taken in the late 1800s in Piazza del Popolo. And, and the stages were built there exactly like in the 1500s. So uh, maybe even the Bulgaris joined these races, but for sure they got so much look at this, uh, at this obelisk that in the 70s, uh, this is uh, sometimes you will see some of these weird pages, uh, exactly like uh, Jean Christophe Robin said, that the book is not like a normal, uh, ordinary guide of Rome, but it's got a lot of artistic design made by Leonardo Sonnoli. And it also um, mix different images coming from the iconography of Rome. So when they looked at that in the 70s, they came out with, this, uh, with these jewels. These jewels are, um, as you can see, coming from the exact shape of some of the hieroglyphics of the obelisk, but of course, being in the 70s, it would have been odd to copy an, uh, an Egyptian ancient hieroglyphic. So they turned it into an optical design um, that was part of the updated culture. And this is a way that Bulgari also always used, taking, borrowing from the past, but update, updating the design in the contemporary age. Then, in this straw that we have from, uh, in Rome, I'm gonna somehow go, sometime go uh, out of the city. I will take you where Rome inspired other cities. Of course, we will go um, several times to, to, to Washington. Uh, but this is, you know it better than me if you live in the US, the Washington Monument is a way to use and to inherit the idea of having an obelisk marking the one of the most important parts of the city. But of course, take it as it is, in the American way. Because if the obelisk in Rome is uh, only 30 meters high, this is 170 meters high. So uh, like the states always make it bigger. Then the same age, 1800s, um, we've got other Egyptian obelisks arriving to Rome. In this case, they are, they've been donated by Egypt to England. The, these two are both called Cleopatra's Needle. They, all, they both come from Alexandria. Uh, they've been set in London and in New York, Central Park, as a gift to, uh, from, from Egypt to uh, these states. And also another one, uh, and it's the uh, oldest one in uh, Place de la Concorde in Paris. And, but if uh, Sixtus V had not set that obelisk in Piazza del Popolo, most probably this idea of having an obelisk to mark the importance of a square in a modern town would have never happened, would have never been there. If we walk through the, the square, we see that the obelisk dialogues with two churches, the so-called twin churches. A century after the setting of the obelisk in the square, uh, another Pope, Alexander VII, commissioned two churches, identical churches. What was the aim of this weird idea? Well, the, the, the aim was to make, to turn, as John Christopher was saying before, Rome into a Baroque city which meant a city that was uh, looking exactly like a theater, a set that you would see in a theater, in an opera um, stage, or in any theater coming from those designed by Palladio in the 1500s. Because the, the only aim 
of this couple of churches that are almost completely identical. You may see that the bell towers are a bit different. The colors of the domes are a bit different. Well, the aim was to displace the visitor. I mean, think of those that uh, didn't have internet, that didn't have uh, photos, uh, and maybe they had never seen any painting made in Rome. They were entering Rome and immediately would feel as if uh, one side of the square was mirrored in the other side of, this, of the square. So they would maybe, even if, uh, even because the maps of Rome were not as precise as detailed as they are today, they was somehow um, feeling lost, but at the same time, feeling amazed by the idea of a city that would uh, grow as if it's mirrored, as, as if uh, it was thought and completely designed by artists. Gian Lorenzo Bernini has some responsibility in this uh, um, idea of the twin churches. Now, twin churches, uh, again, designed in many other uh, ways uh, uh, during the history of art, gave birth to this uh, ring. You see, it, it's a ring in which two pearls are just exposed, just like the domes of the churches. Um, one is black and one is white, just like the domes of these churches. And they're also, just like any natural pearls, um, look the same, but they're not exactly the same since they are natural, exactly like the domes of those churches. Now, I couldn't find many other twin churches all around the world. Uh, I, mm, I may ask you even to make this research, but for sure I know uh, of another um, example of having two twin churches in, uh, in Turin. Uh, and the story of these twin churches is, is really, really amazing because at the, these churches are uh, 20 years, uh, they have a 20 years time difference. Um, and, and, but then the, the facade is completely identical. This is because when uh, the Savoia commissioned both, the first one, um, San Carlo Borromeo, was uh, lacking the facade. So when uh, uh, 20 years later they were building the facade of Santa Cristina, they remembered the battle between churches in Rome and made identical the, 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 the facade of even the very first church. Again, make it something that would look Roman was the idea, was given immediately the idea of prestige and was uh, connecting this architecture to beauty, to the example of beauty. I may say to the eternal idea of beauty, which is the one that uh, since the 1800s and even before was uh, uh, related to Rome. Let's walk through Rome uh, from Piazza del Popolo. What we meet is a so-called trident. Again, the popes were architects, were poets, were absolutely controlling every kind of creativity in their eternal city. And in the 1500s, they started thinking, it was Pope Paul III Farnese, that uh, they could somehow work um, and design the city starting from the street that you see here in the center. Via del Corso, the name Via del Corso comes from that horse race that I showed you before. In Italian, race is said Corsa, okay? So again, the happenings, the events uh, were given names, they gave names to Rome. So Via del Corso was already there, 1600 meters made by the Romans uh, till the Capitol Hill. How can we work on this? Well, Pope Clement IX decided to make the street that you see on the right-hand side of your screen, Via Clementina, named later on Via del Babuino. Leo X, Medici decided to make the other street, to cut, to open the other street, what today is called the Via Ripetta. So as I told you, they, they worked thinking of what was there before. So it was not like Paris or, or Manhattan, you know, drawn on a paper at the same time and built 
with a project. No, Rome is layered vertically, but it's also layered horizontally because they are ideas, different ideas that merge together and live together perfectly with just like this trident that grew up at least in 1300 years, but it looks like as if it's been made all of a sudden in one and only moment. What did the, the, um, the trident tell to the Bulgaris? Well, a, 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 very, a very interesting um, necklace in which the, the square became a ribbon of diamonds and the three streets, Via del Corso, Via Ripetta, became, became this, this uh, uh, pendant hmm, with, uh, with rubies. Um, these photos uh, made by Dan Bello are, are really interesting. You can see he also he always found a way to make it creative, no? the, the uh, illustration of Rome. Now, and it's interesting to say that uh, this um, uh, necklace you see in the 50s, so we're gonna go from the 30s to the 50s to the 70s to the 80s. It's really part of the DNA of Bulgari, the idea of getting inspiration from Rome. This ribbon, you can also detach it from the necklace and it becomes a brooch. Again, these uh, jewels are also playful in a way. And just to, to, let, to, to show you how the idea of having streets that focus all on, on, a, on a point that becomes the, the, the perspective point of a part of the city, uh, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris uh, is just one of the main examples that I, would, I could show you today. Let's walk through. Let's go a little bit further in the Campo Marzio, in this area that goes southbound from Piazza del Popolo. We meet the Pantheon. The Pantheon is the only ancient temple, ancient Roman temple that had not been destroyed, that had not been touched. Its, its structure, it's still the one that belongs to the, uh, the dates back second century AD as, as uh, uh, Emperor Hadrian thought of that. Even if the name you see in front is the one of Agrippa, the uh, son-in-law of Augustus who made the very first Pantheon, but then Hadrian turned it into this rounded architecture that we see. Why hasn't it been touched at all? Because um, one of the latest ruler of Rome, uh, Emperor of Rome, gave it to the Pope as a gift. At the very end, the Roman Emperor had become a Christian Emperor, Empire, sorry. And, uh, and, and of course, it was uh, something quite important to give a tribute, a homage to the Pope. So they, um, uh, the, the Sfoca gave it to uh, the Pope and it, it's been turned into a church. And for this reason, untouchable. And for us, a great piece of luck because we can absolutely still enjoy what was the, the amazing architecture of this place. Think if we only had it read on books and never been able to see that. Now, if we enter the Pantheon, I'm sure many of you entered it, but I don't know if many of you, if how many of you entered it in a very special day because the oculus that is still there and uh, filters the light inside the Pantheon, look how it draws a circle of light uh, on the walls of the, uh, the Pantheon. And just for your information, this is still today the largest dome ever built in one and only piece, 43 meters wide and 43 meters high. It's like half of a sphere. The Romans had calculated that if they had it made a few centimeters larger, it would have collapsed. But they were wise enough and precise enough to make, to make it perfect. No, so going back to this uh, circle of light, it has got a specific aim. Emperor Hadrian, who most probably designed himself this pantheon because he was also 
a quite uh, um, uh, like quite clever architect had calculated with the uh, with the mathematicians um, that in one specific day, which was not any other day, it was uh, the twenty first of April, the birthday of Rome. Well, in that day at noon, now it happens at one p.m. because of the the change of times, no? Uh, but at noon, this is what was happening. The light was pointing the entrance of the Pantheon. And since the Oculus has got the same size of the arch on top of the entrance, the light was, that arch was absolutely lit as, as, as just like a special effect even because that arch is made of white marble that is really shiny when it's touched by light. And of course, what could happen? No? What do you think could happen that 21st of April at noon? Emperor Hadrian used to enter the Pantheon and was saluted by the sun. The sun which was at the top of any uh, religious pyramid of any um, uh, like scale of gods was giving its tribute, saluting and approving the glory of uh, the emperor. And of course, not even one emperor tried to touch this temple because all of the others um, enjoyed this great idea, this clever idea um, had by, no, by Emperor Hadrian, who never forget was also a philosopher, not only a leader of the army as all the others emperors were. The, the jewel, well, there are actually different jewels, but the one that, that we decided to set into this book, and it's very important to say that all of these jewels are, um, uh, um, as you say, historical jewels. Uh, they, they are part of the heritage collection of Bulgari, and they and they are usually and many, many quite several times shown in exhibitions all over the world. So these are not jewels on sale. These are part of the legacy of Bulgari and of their heritage. Well, the, the, the necklace we uh, picked is the, this one here that goes around. Sorry for the picture that is not um, in high definition. It, it goes around the neck of the lady of the model, just like the dome goes around that, uh, that oculus. And somehow, just like the sun enters in this oculus, uh, the beauty of a lady was entering uh, perfectly uh, the, the oculus, let's say the whole of this beautiful uh, gold and diamonds um, necklace. Now, how many, uh, how many uh, pantheon can you see around the world? Uh, for sure the Jefferson Memorial. Well, it's, it's, it's an absolute copy, at least uh, the facade and the dome with the oculus, not of, uh, of, the, of the columns. Uh, but it means that uh, really Washington uh, has been uh, designed as a copy of Rome, not just by chance or just because they picked one place or another, but it was, it's because being another capital making, creating a new capital, just like Baben was saying, that would influence a whole country, would, would, would have mean to have, to be an, a great example, is that like Rome was, have been, had been in Europe. Not only that, uh, the Pantheon scattered around the United States. Charles Civit, Thomas Jefferson designed La Rotunda, which is a library of uh, uh, Virginia University, but, not only that, when he had to design his own residency, Thomas Jefferson uh, remembered of the Pantheon and made the Monticello, which is not far from uh, the Rotunda at uh, Virginia University, just like a small Pantheon, at least the, the idea of the dome that is uh, uh, with the oculus giving light to the main entrance. You see, this architecture, this design entered the um, creativity, the uh, imagination and, 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 and the DNA of uh, architects uh, between the 17 and the 1800s. 
Mm? It, it, is, it is exactly in that moment, in those centuries, that Rome became a model for the world. Let's go further. Not far from the Pantheon, we have another beautiful, important monument that speaks about the grandeur of the Roman Empire. It's uh, the Mausoleum of Augustus, recently reopened, by the way. So next time you come to Rome, you will all, all even have the possibility to enter this beautiful monument, um, uh, the tomb of, uh, of Augustus uh, that, uh, because I, we never underline this, but in, in, in the, for many centuries, the important people used to design and have their tomb built before passing away. So they wanted to be sure that you know, their body would uh, end up somewhere interesting and somewhere um, like prestigious. So this is how it looked at, at that time. It was a kind of um, artificial mountain set uh, to host Augustus and its family. But the, the, the idea of Augustus was not only to have a beautiful um, and prestigious uh, um, tomb, the, because the, the mausoleum was also part of a great, not a great monument uh, designed by the, the idea and commissioned by Augustus, the sundial, another obelisk. The obelisk that is now in front of our chamber, one of the chambers of our parliament, Piazza Montecitorio. That obelisk was projecting its shade on top of a huge plague where all those lines that you see would mark the hours of the day and the days of the year. But in one special day, the 13th of September, the birthday of Augustus, the shade, the, the obelisk would mark the, the beginning of the day, that little squared building that you see on the right hand side of the building. And at the end of the day, the mausoleum. So you know what is what that square building is? It's the Arapaches. It's the um, temple, the altar to peace, which was uh, a way to celebrate the peace set in the empire by Augusto, but also it was a way to celebrate all the ancestors of Augustus, who's also present in the bas reliefs uh, as, as a little child, as a little boy. So the sun, the sun that day was pointing at the beginning of the day, the origin and the birth of Augustus, and at the end of the day, his death. Now you understand where Hadrian had the idea two centuries later, well, sorry, one uh, in 1500 uh, later, to have the sun main uh, character in the architecture of the, of the, of the Pantheon. Just uh, at the base of the, of the Arapaches, it's this, this is huge inscription that uh, uh, was made in the 13, uh, 1937, in which we have all the, the, um, tellings, all the stories uh, wrote by Augustus uh, that would uh, celebrate his achievements. Uh, it's the idea of giving in the 30s uh, uh, a new look to what was ancient. So next to the inscription that you saw before, we have buildings that uh, were made in the uh, rationalist, let's say in the Italian version of the rationalism uh, with the marble of Rome with that the geometry, but celebrating in a modern way, the Roman architectures. And I don't think at all it's just by chance that in 2022, this building in Piazza Augusto Imperatore would host the Bulgari Hotel in Rome. So the DNA, it's not just, so the, 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 the Roman legacy is not just in the jewels, but also in this new experiences that Bulgari offers to visit Rome. Um, Rome was uh, absolutely part of a, a, what I think it's a great idea in the, in the history of jewelry. No? You have to think of jewelry as really a branch of art. Uh? Uh, it's not only painting, sculpting, video, but it's also jewelry became at a certain point so thoughtful that it's really, it's got the same uh, dignity of any other uh, version of art. Now in the 1970s, the, the Bulgaris invented the monete, 
collection, which means set original real coins coming from Greece and Rome in their jewelry uh, and, and, uh, and making them the, the, the central part of these jewels, uh, even because uh, this is what a princess, a Roman princess told me uh, one, one, one day, in the 70s, Rome was not so secure. It was quite easy to be kidnapped, no? to get kidnapped, but also stolen if you, you had uh, very shiny jewels. Well, these coins were not interesting for thieves. They were not so shiny, but at the same time, was so they were so elegant and so meaningful for those that created it and those that were wearing them. Now I have time only for another site. Oh, this is another um, uh, sorry, another uh, idea of how uh, that mausoleum inspired a mausoleum in England. I want to end up yes with this, which is uh, absolutely I think the most inspiring part of Rome for the world, the Capitol Square on top of Capitol Hill. Uh, the, the, the capital here in Rome, not the capital here in, in Washington. Um, here we have the, 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 the mixture, the encounter of ancient art, because this is where the tabularium, the ancient Roman tabularium was, then um, moved and changed by Michelangelo, who designed these three buildings that host today the Capitolini Museums and the headquarters of the municipality of Rome, but he also designed the square, the, 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 these star, these flowery stars that start from the center where we have the, uh, the, 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 the statue of Emperor um, um, Marc Aurelius. Um, but not only that, look at this stairway, the so-called Cordonata. This is how Michelangelo wanted the people to go up to the Capitol Hill and somehow guess how with those buildings he made a geometrical drawing in the sky. You see that the buildings are not perpendicular. They are not shifted so that he designed this uh, different um, geometrical shape in the sky. And I'm marking this stairway because it's gonna be important later on. Now, the design of the square gave birth to another jewel. It's a brooch in which you have diamonds and rubies that spread out from a central diamond, just like the, uh, the design of Michelangelo that has got a name. Thanks to this drawing, the square looks much larger than it actually is. Of course, for those that look at it from above, exactly like this jewel that has got a kind of a projection out of the body of those that wear it. Now, uh, of course, we cannot speak of, uh, like of the Capitol Hill in Rome without mentioning, since we are virtually all in Washington today, uh, the, the National Mall in, in Washington with the, the Capitol that you can see now at the, at the front of this image. Now, the weird thing is that you saw the Capitol Hill in Rome. Where, how could they call Capitol Hill an architecture, a piece of architecture that has nothing to do with the, with the real Capitol Hill in Rome? Where did they, you know, where was the bug? Where did, they, <laughs> where did they make the mistake? Well, somehow they merged. They merged the idea of the Capitol Hill, the, the political center of Rome with another architecture, the Dome of St. Peter's which was the other center of Rome. So the, 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 the secular center, the political center and the religious center merged together in this new idea of a Capitol Hill. Even because in the 1800s when they made it, few people had the chance from, the, from Washington to come to Rome and verify that the Capitol Hill was not looking like that. Uh, in, inside an Italian painter draw the squares of the dome of the Pantheon and a beautiful glory of, uh, of, of Washington, a, 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 as if it's uh, the, the dome of St. Peter's. So you can see all of Rome, all different kinds of, uh, of uh, details of Rome merged into this beautiful modern monument. Now, quick question. I'm almost at the end, um, director, don't you worry. Um, how many capitals are there in the USA? 
I'm, um, I'm waiting for you to, to answer in your mind or in the chat. Well, I uh, found a list and apparently in the United States, we have 40 capitals. Almost all the states of, of uh, the United States have, have uh, a capital. But is it a capital that looks like the one we actually have in Rome? Or is it a capital that uh, recalls the one in Washington? Well, as I told you, it was not that easy for artists and architects to come to Rome and verify. So they got inspiration from uh, the, the one in, uh, in, in, in Washington. And, uh, but of, of course, all the, actors, the architects made their own version. Uh, so they, uh, they somehow changed it, but they only kept one detail. What you always find in the Capitol Hills all around the US is the stairway. It's not the stairway that Michelangelo designed in Rome, but it's the idea of ascending. Exactly like Michelangelo made us ascend to the main, the most important hill of ancient Rome, these architects kept the idea that when you enter the public institution, the center of these towns, you should ascend to uh, a major, a, a higher feeling. Mm? Now, then in Baton Rouge, uh, Baton Rouge, I don't know what happened. They, they forgot about the, the dome. They made it like a, a more of a Soviet building. But anyhow, uh, still, uh, the idea of uh, the, the dome, the ascending, the um, columns, and the capital, and, and the beautiful dome coming from the one in St. Peter's uh, um, remained, and somehow scattered. Uh, the presence of Rome all around the world. You would never say that we have a St. Peter's Dome even in Africa. In, the, in Ivory Coast, in 1990, this is what they call, it's the largest church of the world. Well, it's not large in terms of interiors, it's large in terms of, of uh, complex of architecture, but uh, believe me, when I discovered uh, St. Peter's in Rome, I, would, I was really absolutely 100% confirmed that if you get inspiration from Rome, you cannot get mistaken. And this is why Bulgari made it, uh, made this choice at the end of the 1800s and is still going on making Rome the DNA of their design. Thank you very much for listening. Costantino, io sono romano di Roma, come si dice, as we say there, I'm a Roman from Rome, and uh, I've never looked at the city in this way. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure that the audience will have uh, lots of questions for you, but uh, before that, uh, we want you to experience firsthand how Rome inspired two great authors. The first of our two readings is going to be by André Asiman. Mr. Asiman is uh, an Italian-American writer, and he is the author of uh, acclaimed books such as Call Me By Your Name and Find Me. He also teaches comparative literature at uh, the Graduate Center Center of the City University of New York, and his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New Republic, Conan Us Traveler, and in many volumes of the best American essays. He will read for us uh, today a short story titled Palm Sunday on the Spanish Steps. Andre, we are incredibly happy to have you with us. The screen is yours. Thank you very much, Emanuele. I'm going to read it, so I'm not going to be looking at the camera. Forgive me. Um, Sunday. The year is 1966. I am 15 and my parents, my aunt, my brother and I have decided to visit the Spanish steppes. Since our expulsion from Egypt almost a year before, we have been living in Rome, yet this is the first time I see Piazza di Spagna decorated with blooming flowers and colorful flower pots crowding the steps all the way up to the church of the Trinita dei Monti. People are brimming over the steps this morning and we need to squeeze through throngs of tourists and Romans enjoying the first clear signs of spring weather. Everything is beautiful, everyone everywhere is beautiful. 
I've heard about spring, but never experienced spring before. And to do so now on Palm Sunday is and will remain a day bookmarked for the rest of my life. On Palm Sunday, the world is stunning, sunlit and desirable. All I've known growing up in Alexandria is temperate winters followed by intense summers and in between the two, unmistakable assurances of beach weather, which starts in early March and lasts all the way into November. I know I am happy, partly because of the weather and because school is out for Easter, but also because my father is staying with us on a short visit from Paris, where he's been promising to have all of us move once, as he likes to say, things settled down. This, I would soon realize, is his way of delaying so many things, especially those that should be seized but are invariably adjourned. He passes this trait on to me. In a picture taken that, taken that, pic that day, I am wearing a wool blazer, a leather tie, and a long sleeve white polo shirt and gray flannel trousers. I am boiling and dying to take off my shoes and socks and dunk one bared foot and the other into the barcaccia, which sits at the bottom of the steps. This should have been a beach day. And perhaps this is also why the day resonates with me so much. A year ago, we were probably celebrating our last spring holiday at our beach house in Alexandria. Today, had we been living in Alexandria, we'd be doing the same. But on the Spanish steps, I'm still unable to identify the elusive mystery linking the clamor of impressions racing through my mind. Perhaps I am reluctant to know what exactly unites the city to Alexandria, to the weather, to the beautiful faces around me, and to that long familiar yearning to jump into seawater. All I know is that I like feeling we're no longer a dismembered family. I like the thought that my father might actually move us to Paris, where I know we belong. I belong. We head up to the Trinita dei Monti, then onto the grounds of Villa Borghese and find ourselves coming down the Pincho. It's time for a quick snack. We stop at a bar on Via delle Vite, Via della Vite, sorry, and each of us orders a refreshment and a panino to tide us over until lunch at home. A week later, my father has gone back to Paris. On that Saturday, I am by myself on Piazza di Spagna. Lots of tourists are still milling about. Most of the flower pots have been removed, though some still remain. I'm reluctant to head back home yet, so I hang around the Spanish steps, not entirely aware that what I may be trying to do is repeat last week's family outing. By lunchtime, I stop by the same corner cafe on Via de la Vite and order the same cold drink and cold slow sandwich. On that same street, I discover an Anglo-American bookstore. And after entering and finally finding a book, ask the price of a Penguin Classics edition of Dubliners. I know my father would approve, Inside the store, a young man turns around and tells me I've selected a wonderful book, adding that Joyce had actually written parts of that book in no other place than Rome. I let him know that I've been reading a portrait of an artist as a young man, and I'm eager to read Dubliners. I can tell from his accent that he is French. So instead of English or Italian, we start speaking in French. It turns out we like the same authors and enjoy discovering, discussing our favorites. He is scanning a book of short stories by Catherine Mansfield, and once he decides to purchase it, hands it to the salesman, grabs my book from my hand, and offers to buy it for me. I refuse, he insists, I relent. While the owner of the shop is busy wrapping both books, we speak about other authors, about school, about Rome and Paris, and eventually I tell him about Alexandria, finally confiding that I would like to write someday. You should, he says. His family lives in Paris. I tell him mine is planning to move there. Once our books are wrapped, I decide to leave the store. He'd walk with me, he says. Where was I going? I was headed to the Spanish steps to read, I explain, without really know knowing why I've made this up. Well, goodbye then, he says, and we shake hands. 
soon I am sitting on the warm Spanish steps and have cautiously unwrapped my book and I'm already reading it. The area is unusually quiet, peaceful, with far fewer people except for stragglers, the usual riffraff, and tired tourists who are quietly eating sandwiches and slices of pizza. Like me, everyone is sitting on the steps. I can feel the sunlight on my knees while the heat from the marble steps sends a warm, comforting shiver up my spine. I am focusing on what I'm reading. Something about the book indefinitely thrills me. I also want to be transported back to my last week's outing on Palm Sunday and retrieve the feeling of well-being that had erupted in me and made me long for a whiff of marine salt. I am loving Araby. The young Frenchman from the bookstore suddenly appears and seems to be startled by my presence on the steps. He walks up to me and says he's happy to run into me again. I don't want to encourage him and put on the kind of chilly, forbidding look I've been taught to affect. He doesn't understand, stares at me quizzically, then shakes his head and following a long, awkward silence, leaves without saying goodbye. For a month or so after that day, every Saturday, I would buy the same coleslaw sandwich, step into the same bookstore, buy a new paperback and head for the Spanish steps. One day I bought the first volume of Lawrence Durrell's Justine and while reading discovered all the page in his pages, the Alexandrian poet Cavafy who writes about a city he'll never be able to flee or even be rid of. It's not clear what he means by city. Perhaps I don't want to understand, though I think I know, surely I know. And suddenly, as I'm reading, everything about Piazza di Spagna begins to spiral inside me. Alexandria, Cavafi, Rome, the first stirrings of spring weather, the illusory promise of a faraway beach, my father's visit, the lure of Paris, the young Frenchman who bought me Dubliners and whose feelings I'd hurt because it was easier to snub him than hear him out. And finally, Joyce himself who'd fled Dublin but couldn't get it out of his system and kept yearning for it right here in Rome. I felt like a freshly scanned palimpsest whose layers of ink might, read, might need years of resurfacing. For the next two years with the weather holding, I would come and read here every Saturday, scanning the steps and strangers around me, resolved to stand and wait here not always knowing what I was waiting for, sensing all along, though that Rome and Palm Sunday and the books I love to read here were all a perfect, a, sorry, a pretext as everything about me on the Spanish steps had become a pretext to something almost ineffable that would take a lifetime to sort out, but could just as easily be staring me in the face. I wanted to be a writer, but I feared what I wanted to write. Thank you. This was very touching. Thanks uh, so much for uh, reading your story for us, Andre. It was beautiful. And uh, uh, now I am uh, truly delighted to call on screen for the second and final reading, Melania Mazzucco. Melania Mazzucco won uh, the Premio Strega, Italy's uh, leading uh, literary award with uh, Vita, an incredible novel. Her books uh, have been published in 27 countries and many of them have been adapted into successful films. She's also a regular contributor to the most uh, important Italian newspapers. Today, Melania will read for us her story Roma e Donna, il suo nome è Plautilla. Rome is a woman, her name is Plautilla. Melania will read for us in Italian, but uh, an English translation will be provided on screen. Melania, grazie per essere con noi oggi. The screen is yours. Grazie, buonasera a tutti e tutte. Allora, Roma e Donna e si chiama Plautilla. Ci sono oggetti magici. Chi abbia conferito loro il misterioso potere di migliorare la vita delle persone non è dato sapere. Ma tutti lo sanno e qualunque cosa credano lo accettano. Roma ne abbonda. Sono pietre, porte, immagini, ossa, vasti come finestre, piccoli come melograni, oppure minuscoli, schegge di materia organica, custodite in teche polverose e scatole metalliche, 
da cui un oblò lascia balenare un riverbero biancastro, oppure nelle vetrinette di un museo dove un'etichetta li spiega e neutralizza per sempre. Così separati da noi cessano di fare del bene e tacciono. Ritornano a essere ciò che furono, cose. Lei no. Grande come una donna viva, se ne sta nella penombra della navata e aspetta. Piazza del Popolo è un teatro, immensamente vuota, aspetta uno spettacolo che non inizia mai, finché non comprendi che esso è Roma stessa e puoi esserne protagonista. Benché sia uno spazio aperto, è un luogo chiuso e prevede un solo ingresso. Come attraverso un boccascena, nella monumentale illusione bisogna entrare dalla porta, porta del popolo, come tutti quelli che per millenni sono arrivati a Roma da nord, pellegrini, accattoni, sovrani, profughi, giovani in cerca del proprio destino, e a piedi per avere il tempo di lasciarsi alle spalle il caos assordante del muro torto e sorprendersi dell'improvviso silenzio. A Roma tutto è rumore e niente musica. Rombo, rintocco, stridore, tonfo, fischio, urlo, le macchine, le ambulanze, i motorini, i martelli pneumatici, le campane, le sirene, le spazzole delle pulitrici, i camion della spazzatura. Tutti chiassano, ciascuno suona per sé, non siamo mai un'orchestra. Anche la lingua della strada grida, è una città ad alto volume, ma a Piazza del Popolo puoi sentire i tuoi passi. L'obelisco è un punto esclamativo, sembra sia sempre stato lì, come un'enigmatica meridiana e in effetti pur essendo stato eretto solo nel 1589 precede tutto il resto. Sul granito rosato si susseguono geroglifici di cui non decifriamo il messaggio. Ne arriva uno sorprendente. Roma ti accoglie con un monumento straniero. Con maliziosa arroganza ti dice di essere talmente sicura di sé da fare proprio tutto ciò che è altro. Come se niente a Roma potesse restare a lungo straniero. Intorno i leoni di pietra accucciati sonnecchiano, ammansiti, ma non per sempre. Lo zodiaco di Roma prevede due sole costellazioni, nata sotto il segno dei gemelli, ascendente leone. Davanti a te, come nelle favole, si aprono tre strade, hanno nomi sintetici ed evocativi, babuino, corso, ripetta. Formano i cosiddetti tridente. Roma ti saluta ficcandoti un forcone nel cuore. Il manico di cui esse formano i rebbi è invisibile da qualche parte oltre la molle bianca del vittoriano. Tu indugi, indeciso, sei ancora straniero, non conosci le leggende romane, altrimenti sapresti quale soglia varcare. Le due chiese all'imbocco del tridente sembrano identiche, infatti le chiamano gemelle. Ti ricorderai di Romolo e Remo. Roma è nata doppia. Ogni cosa è lo specchio e la metà di un'altra, ma non sono gemelle del tutto. Eterozigote, si assomigliano, si imitano, ma non combaciano. Quella di sinistra la chiamiamo la chiesa degli artisti. Nessuno ricorda più il suo vero nome. A Roma, città di papi, artisti e plebei contano più i nomi che si scelgono o che vengono attribuiti di quelli ricevuti. Da Piazza del Popolo la separa un porticato grandioso. Le colonne sembrano rubate a un tempio greco, ma non è così. Vengono da un campanile che è esistito appena qualche giorno. Gian Lorenzo Bernini, uno dei geni del luogo, un fantasma che ti accompagna anche se tu non te ne senza che tu te ne accorga, le aveva fabbricate perché abbellissero il campanile di San Pietro, anzi i campanili. Ben prima di New York, nel suo cuore Roma avrebbe avuto due torri gemelle, altissime e presuntuose. Disturbavano il profilo del paesaggio e perfino la terra su cui poggiavano le rifiutò sprofondando, le fecero smantellare. Le colonne rimasero sul tetto della vita di San Pietro a calcinarsi al sole e poi sul finire del Seicento le rimontarono nel pronao della chiesa, che sembra così un tempio vagano, e in qualche modo lo è. Lei è sull'altar maggiore fin da quando ancora non era stato costruito il tetto. Ha un sorriso dolce, quasi imbarazzato. Per secoli le donne del rione sono venute a pregarla, Accendevano un cero e sussuravano qualcosa. Perché i desideri fossero esauditi, nessuno doveva ascoltarle. A volte tornavano e in segno di gratitudine lasciavano una catenina, una lamina, una moneta. Raramente un biglietto, perché le carte tutti le leggono e invece il loro era stato un dialogo privato. Lei sapeva perché cosa era ringraziata. Un bambino, per lo più. 
alla madre di tutte le madri. Le donne chiedevano soprattutto un figlio. E lei, dipinta su una tela che fingeva di essere una tavola antica di legno, stringendo il suo fra le braccia, ascoltava, comprensiva. Sorrideva sempre. Le donne di Roma sapevano che non era una Madonna qualunque. Ce n'erano ovunque, in ogni chiesa e perfino ai crocicchi. Era una Madonna magica. Si era infatti dipinta da sola. A Roma ce n'erano svariati di oggetti non creati da mano umana. L'autoritratto di Dio alla Scala Santa, quello del santo bambino alla Raceli, la Madonna di San Luca a Santa Maria del Popolo. Ma questa era diversa, perché la Madonna si era dipinta per aiutare una bambina qualunque. E come aveva aiutato lei, avrebbe aiutato tutte le donne a diventare se stesse. E così in effetti ha sempre fatto. E se ci credete, lo farà ancora. Tutte le storie sono vere se ti affidi a esse. Col tempo le donne di Roma hanno dimenticato il nome di quella bambina, perché non sembrava importante. Era stata solo lo strumento affinché si colpisse, compisse qualcos'altro, un po' come Maria stessa. Invece, proprio per questo va pronunciato, ancora di più oggi, perché i desideri e i sogni delle donne non sono più rinchiusi nel loro corpo, ma pretendono il mondo intero. Si chiamava Plautilla Briccia. Era romana, nata un giorno d'estate sotto il segno del leone, a pochi passi da lì. Il padre, pittore, poeta e scrittore, voleva che fosse pittrice e le insegnò a disegnare e dipingere. Ma non era famoso, né ricco e nemmeno potente. E si era ammalato e non poteva più procurarle la dote affinché potesse sposarsi e nemmeno aiutarla a farsi un nome. Allora gli venne in mente che poteva fare molto di più inventarle un destino e mise in giro una bella storia come fanno tutti gli scrittori raccontò che Plautilla a 11 anni aveva iniziato a dipingere una madonna col bambino e che inesperta non era stata capace di terminarla e l'aveva abbandonata finché una notte era intervenuta Maria dal cielo e l'aveva completata per lei Plautilla era la prescelta l'eletta la consacrava alla Vergine e alla Verginità e alla pittura di Madonna. D'ora in poi, a Roma, chi avesse voluto una Madonna poteva rivolgersi a lei. Quanto al quadro, lo donò ai frati carmelitani. Lo esponessero nella loro chiesa, quella immagine miracolosa avrebbe fatto prodigi. I frati accettarono e col tempo la loro chiesetta non fu più adeguata ad alloggiare una, un ospite così prestigiosa. La spostarono in un'altra e infine le costruirono attorno una chiesa tutta nuova. Questa. Plautilla non aveva scelto né di essere pittrice, né di essere pittrice di Madonne, e neanche la verginità. Nel Seicento una ragazza non poteva scegliere, nel migliore dei casi poteva essere scelta. Non aveva dipinto un quadro magico, ma soltanto un quadro, a olio, su tela, con pigmenti che comprava in una semplice bottega e pennelli fatti con setole di maiale. Ma proprio come un ritaglio di tela qualunque divenne un talismano perché fu creduto tale, così Plautilla Briccia capì che essere creduta messaggera l'avrebbe resa effettivamente tale. Accettò. In questo fu vera Ancilla Domini. Divenne molto più di quello che il padre si augurava. Fu pittrice e architettrice in un tempo nel quale neppure esisteva la parola per definire una donna architetto. Costruì una villa, una cappella palazzi. Ed è ancora, anzi, più oggi che in passato, messaggera di un mondo possibile. Cominciate perciò la vostra visita a Roma nella chiesa degli artisti. Sostate davanti alla Madonna di Plautilla Briccia e poi avventuratevi nelle viscere di una città appassionata, orgogliosa e diffidente come una donna. Lo hanno sempre ripetuto scrittori e poeti. Roma è femmina. Una donna, Seducente, ribelle e non sottomessa, come la vestale da cui è stata generata. Thank you very much, Melania. Grazie mille. A very inspiring and meaningful story, quite uh, timely, considering that uh, we are celebrating Women's History Month in the United States. And uh, now I am very happy to open the floor to the audience for some uh, questions to our speakers. And I would like to welcome on screen also our interpreter, Lilia Pino-Bluan. Okay. Um, 
I'm afraid that we don't have much time for uh, too many questions. Uh, there are lots of comments and uh, messages of appreciation, but uh, I will try and pick at least um, one question for uh, each of you. And uh, I would like to start uh, with you, uh, Costantino. Uh, someone is asking about uh, the twin churches in Piazza del Popolo. And I like this question also because it's somehow uh, linked to the reading uh, by uh, Melania Mazzucco. So the question is, are the two churches identical uh, even inside and uh, also um, another question for you um, someone is asking uh, about the first uh, obelisk uh, that uh, uh, arrived to Rome uh, was uh, uh, it intended as a gift can you tell us more uh, about that um, first of all I, I forgot one important detail before um, the, the book that, that gave us the chance to meet today, um, it, it's of course, uh, it hosts a text uh, that I wrote about Rome, text by uh, Andre, by Melania and other writers, but it, it's, it's uh, the result of a, of a work of a team, of old team, and the Bulgari team, uh, which I, I, whom I worked with uh, uh, for seven years in this research in the archives, uh, of Bulgari finding on the links uh, is absolutely the, the main responsible for uh, the, this this book and this research. Then uh, uh, coming from uh, going from to, to these questions, well, no, they, they are not absolutely the same. Well, as a matter of fact, they are not even uh, managed by the same priests, by the same orders. So the destiny of these churches inside is uh, absolutely is completely. Uh, different. So th they had a, a parallel life. They look the same outside, but when you enter inside, of course, the architecture is the same with the, with the chapels all around and the main altar uh, in the center, um, but at the bottom, uh, but there is not one single piece that uh, looks the same inside. Um, then instead, talking about the, the obelisk, well, the first obelisk was the the one brought by Augustus to Rome, the one uh, uh, he used for the sundial, that it's now in front of Piazza, uh, Palazzo Montecitorio. And I wouldn't say it was a gift. It was not a gift at all. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea of bringing an obelisk to Rome uh, came to Augustus because he wanted to mark the fact that he had conquered Egypt after the, the Battle of Azio that um, let him win over Marc Antonio and Cleopatra, uh, he um, basically wanted to show how Rome had become, had overwhelmed the most ancient civilization of the Mediterranean. Uh, Egypt was much older than Rome, than the Roman Empire, than uh, the city of Rome. But having this symbol of Egypt caught and set in Rome would create this link between the two civilizations and would make Rome the heir, the direct heir of the Egyptian civilization. As a matter of fact, for those that know a little bit the history of Rome, we like to say, historians like to say that of course, politically Rome conquered Egypt, but was absolutely conquered by the fashion, the taste, the, all the details of the civilization, they entered Rome and never left it. For some historians, this uh, absorbing of the Egyptian civilization, civilization was also the reason and the fact that led slowly in uh, almost 500 years, uh, the Roman empire to collapse and to fail. Because just like, uh, a virus, this civilization entered Rome and set it far and far from the origin of ancient Rome. It's a complicated speech, but I hope it arrived. Thank you very much, Costantino. Grazie mille. And uh, uh, now uh, I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Baben. We have uh, uh, actually a few questions about uh, Bulgari's designs, but uh, before that, I also would like to mention for uh, everyone who is asking that yes, uh, the book uh, is available for purchase. You can find it online. Um, just uh, look for it uh, at uh, Rizzoli's uh, bookstore. The exact title is Bulgari Roma Travel Tales for Beauty Lovers. 
And uh, uh, now, uh, Jean Christophe, uh, many are asking about uh, uh, Bulgari's designs and uh, how they've been inspired from Rome in the sense that, uh, as we have seen during the presentation, uh, the idea of Rome uh, changed uh, throughout the years. Uh, it took uh, many uh, different uh, shapes and it evolved. And so uh, did also uh, Bulgari's designs that uh, were inspired by Rome and Bulgari's idea of Rome uh, evolve and uh, change uh, accordingly? Well, uh, actually, I'm glad that people acknowledge that Rome is not only a museum, but uh, an ever-evolving city. And uh, de facto, I mean, Rome has been probably the only city on the planet uh, which for 27 centuries has ever been at the forefront uh, of art, of architecture. Uh, we talked about the Baroque uh, before, which is really born in Rome. And uh, what Bulgari tries to do is obviously uh, to get an inspiration but uh, not really to replicate any kind of symbol of the city, but rather to try to interpret it in a very contemporary way. I think one of the best example is probably, uh, not sure it shows, the B01. Uh, the B01 has been inspired by the Colosseo, uh, but obviously it's not, I mean, an antique Colosseo turned into a ring. It's a very, very uh, emblematic and uh, I would say contemporary expression of what the Colosseo stands for turned into a very modern jewel. And this is exactly uh, what makes the success of Bulgari. We are not a postcard. Uh, we are not copying anything, I mean, from the Roman world, uh, whether it's Baroque period rather than uh, the antique Roma, but we try to project into the future uh, some symbols which have been really uh, landmarks of that civilization, that culture, and various times. The same is, you know, uh, with our uh, eye jewelry, with uh, Cabochon. Cabochon has been directly inspired from cupolas. Uh, Constantino has lectured us a lot about the cupolas, the domes, but by no means the Cabochon are cut exactly as uh, cupolas. The Cabochon are kind of uh, very, very, uh, I would say, uh, modern expression uh, of what a cupola used to be, uh, but they are uh, connecting with this uh, unique city where you can see so many cupolas. I think the city has 900 churches, and probably out of the 900 churches, uh, half of them have a cupola, whether it's a major one like Vatican, St. Peter Church, or a minor one. Uh, but it's everywhere, and this is a government. So this is a way uh, Bulgari is interpreting the city, uh, projecting some shapes uh, in a very contemporary and futuristic way, not just I mean replicating uh, as a postcard or as a kind of relic. Thank you so much, Mr. Baben. Grazie mille. And uh, I think we have uh, uh, time for uh, one last question uh, that I would like to address uh, to both uh, our authors, uh, Melania and uh, André. Uh, someone is asking uh, about uh, um, the way uh, in which uh, you write and uh, how does this change according to the city uh, in which you are, because uh, you uh, both wrote uh, about uh, different cities other than uh, Rome. So do uh, city rhythms and uh, uh, routines have uh, a specific uh, influence uh, on your style and uh, the way in which uh, uh, you write? Melania, vai si tu prima, dai. Dunque, io sono romana, sono nata a Roma, ho cercato di scappare e di emigrare. I am Roman. I was born here. I tried to run away and to migrate elsewhere to repeat uh, the story of my family. One of my grandfathers emigrated to the United States um, in the beginning of the 20th century, together with millions of Italians who um, emigrated with nothing. He was only 12 years old and he probably had no shoes even. The other grandfather had migrated to Africa at the time of uh, the Ethiopian colony. He was a shop owner and he tried to open a store there in Addis Ababa and then uh, resettled in Kenya. So in my family, there's a long tradition of people looking elsewhere, but I have uh, always written in Rome. The only other city where I have written is Venice, where I spent quite some time working on a book on Tintoretto. 
Rome belongs to me. Um, it's a place where the past is still very present. Rome is a ghost. And we walk through um, the remains of the past and blend them in with the real city. Here, the past is ever so present. I live in a place where one lives and breathes history. On the other hand, what I don't find here is an outlook to the future. But in terms of what the past has to give, Rome is ever so present. Thank you. André. Um, it's, it's complicated. I spent my adolescence in Rome. And so um, these are, were very, very formative years. And at the same time, they've sort of been swept away. They're, they're way too long ago. But when I start writing, if I can write about Rome, everything falls into place. There's a sense of order and continuity and honesty, especially candor and honesty that I find every time I write about Rome, if I set a story in Rome, suddenly everything begins to make sense. I don't know why. I could set it in Paris where I've also lived or in New York where I'm currently living and have lived for many, many years. They don't have the same effect. To put a story in Rome suddenly gives it a shape. Um, clearly, uh, Rome is the, as Freud once said, it is sort of the perfect metaphor for the psyche. In other words, there are so many levels, so much is buried. And beneath the buried things, there are more buried things that I find myself, whenever I'm writing, if I can even dip into one stratum, I'm already very happy as a writer. I feel very satisfied. Okay, I, I am afraid that uh, we are running out of time, but uh, before we end this webinar, uh, please bear with me for a moment as I have a long list of uh, thank yous. Uh, program like this uh, require collaboration, the collaboration of many people, and I would like to express my deepest gratitude once again to Bulgari and their CEO, Jean Christophe Baben, for being with us today. Of course, I would like to say thank you also to all our speakers, Professor Costantino Dorazio, Andrea Asiman, Melania Mazzucco and uh, our interpreter uh, Lilia Pino Bluan. Also allow me to say thank you to uh, Pam Sommers at Rizzoli New York and a big big grazie to Bulgari's team in Rome, Lucia Boscaini, Carlotta Sapia and Luca Casarotto Romer. Without uh, their help this program wouldn't have been possible. I hope that uh, this webinar inspired you. As uh, you have seen you can find uh, traces of Rome in uh, many different works of art in many different cities countries even outside of Rome and even outside of Italy and uh, that's why we like to call it I think the eternal city. Thank you all for connecting with us today. Arrivederci. Bye-bye. Thank you Emanuele. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you Mike.